the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people. We want to acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we live and work here in our Bay Area. I've also put a link into the chat box on both YouTube and Zoom, and it links to a map where you can look up wherever you are, and you too can put in the chat box what territory you are residing on. We also want to acknowledge the painful situation our country continues to be in with Black Lives Matter and know that SFPL is not a neutral institution and we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and working on our own systemic racism um, and collective action to end systemic racism and work towards equity in our country. Libraries do all this great work by providing uh, factual and useful information and there's a link in the document in the chat boxes that I shared that has links to all of these great resources we've developed, as well as a bunch of other great information and information that I will be taking notes today on today's presentation and I will try to keep up, but you can link back to that and save that link and I'll send a forward email after the event. By the way, my name is Anissa Malady and I am your librarian host today. So we're going to go ahead and jump in to some announcements. I'm going to go back, back, back. We want you to know that today we are all here for a redo of Harlem of the West. We have um, Elizabeth and Lou out on Juneteenth and you know we were still getting started and had some tech difficulties but I think we got it under control now. So thank you, Lou, and thank you, Elizabeth, for redoing with us. SFPL loves you, and we're excited that you're back. So you can all purchase the book through MOAD, our partners today, and we're excited about that. The book is gorgeous. I encourage you all to check it out. It is just full of beautifulness, coffee table size. It's gorgeous. Check it out. Buy it. Support our local bookstores. And some upcoming events from MOAD. We are really excited about all the partnerships we get to go, do with MOAD and it continues. So please join us. Super important five days left. You must take the census. So much rides on this. $20,000 per count for the next two, 10 years for essential services. It's a very um, important thing. Please take your census. Uh, deadline to register to vote is Monday, October 19th. We'll have a lot of uh, voting um, information coming out through the library, as well as 17 branches will be polling places. And we are celebrating Viva Latino Heritage Month and lots of authors, including lots of authors and lots of art. We've had a lot of art, which is so fun. Um, Calixto Robles, he's a Mission District artist. He'll be coming up. And um, we also are celebrating Mr. Benjamin Boxiera. He is our On the Same Page author. On the Same Page is a reading campaign. We try to get our entire community to read the same book. His book is launching on September 30th in which he will also be in conversation with Luis Rodriguez that night. So definitely you must attend this one. Both just amazing authors. Luis Rodriguez, just totally amazing. And Benjamin is an activist, artist, um, educator, works at City College, educates there, and just an amazing guy. So please come support these two. Um, Sunday, we have Daniel Azama, a partnership with the Mexican Museum. He's joining us from Mexico. So sort of the silver linings of um, our new stay in place kind of place. Check it out, lots of things. Um, another Heyday book, this is also a partnership with Heyday. We'll have Dick Evans and Kathy Chen Leong um, celebrating their new book, Chinatown. Dick Evans did a book about the mission. The photography is just gorgeous. So come check this one out. Real generous people. We're also celebrating One City, One Book. And I need to get that annual out of there. It's not, not an annual this year. We are doing it in March, 2021. And we'll be celebrating Chanel Miller's Know My Name. It's an amazing book. It's a heavy book. I encourage you to buy or check it out now. And you might need to put it down and come back to it because it, it's pretty heavy, but it's so important too. Um, please come check it out. Uh, Chanel also has a amazing triptych uh, mural that is visible from Hyde Street at the Asian Art Museum. Go check that out too. Oh, what? Take your census. Tell everybody to tell everybody to take their census. It is an act of resistance. It is an act of activism. 
Don't be afraid. Please take it. SFPL to go, six locations now. You can place holds on all your books, DVDs, materials, and pick them up. And we are launching mid-October another round of libraries to go. Speaking of libraries to go, all my library family working out there in the streets, um, please wear your masks to help my library families and all our other community who works out in the streets and uh, serves us on a daily. Um, beautiful art by Samuel Rodriguez. And just mask up, it's easy. City testing still happening, sf.gov slash city test sf. You follow us on Instagram, you can also see a bunch of other places where testing happens. Beautiful art to remind us all to vote by Alexandra Bloom. She just did an uh, art talk last week. Gorgeous, was it last week? It was this week. <laughs> what day is it? But vote. And a special thanks to our friends of the library who now have an online bookstore as well. And you can pick up that One City, One Book and all of our Viva authors from there. I'm so excited again today to have um, Elizabeth Pippin Silva and Lewis Watts back in our house. Um, for a redo and for just their generosity. They're wonderful and their, their presentation is amazing. Elizabeth Pippin Silva is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, photographer, writer, and former day manager at the historic Fillmore Auditorium. She holds a degree in journalism from SF State. Lou Watts is a photographer, archivist, and professor of art at UC Santa Cruz with long-standing interest in cultural landscape of the African diaspora in the Bay Area and internationally. So let's give a big hand for Lou and Liz. I'm going to mute and hide. All right, let's see if we can. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the being here today with us. We're enormously grateful. Um, I agree. Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure, Lou, if you were going to chime in. Um, uh, so we start. You, are you want to, is there anything you want to say at the beginning, Elizabeth? Uh, I want to thank uh, San Francisco Public Library and MOAD for, and Heyday Books for again uh, being part of this presentation. Um, we appreciate. Uh, all three organizations support and they've just been so generous with their time in um, doing this second talk. It's I'm very, very grateful. Lewis and I both are. So thank you. And thank you to everyone for being here today. We're thrilled to be able to do a redo. Also, uh, there's been a couple of questions. This is actually being recorded, so you'll be able to access it uh, later, which is great. Also, um, if uh, I think at the end, uh, there'll be a message that will have our emails because if, during our last recording, we heard from some families and people we, we really wanted to communicate with and that all got lost. So um, if, if you, uh, you can put something on the chat, but also if there's something you, information you think we could use or want to talk to us, please email us and we'll get that information. Okay, let, why don't we begin? Well, I also I just uh, was reminded that we are kicking off San Francisco History Days, which is this incredible weekend of celebrating San Francisco history in many different forms. We encourage you, encourage you to go to their website, sfhistorydays.org, and see all the incredible presentations um, that are being done this weekend. There's most of them are online, but there are a few that are actually uh, ones that you can participate in person, of course, masked and socially distanced. So please go to their website and uh, encourage you to um, participate this weekend. There's so many great things. I know I'm definitely staying home this weekend and, and signing on for some of the talks. We are all about history here. We are. It has been um, for both Lewis and I over 30 year passion um, project uh, working on Harlem of the West. And it's just been incredible that we are now in the book's fourth edition with new and updated material and photographs. Um, when we started this, we never expected in a million years that that we would uncover so much history and that so many people would reach out to us and be so generous with their time, their stories, 
their um, archival photos and memorabilia. So we want to acknowledge everyone that helped us to create this book because it definitely took many, many people, not just ourselves. We're simply the receptacles for all this information that we've gathered over the last 30 years. Um, so not only do we have a book, but we also have a um, museum exhibit and a website, um, harlemofthewestsf.com, you spell it all out. And on that website, you can um, hear and read the entire interviews uh, from many people that we interviewed in this book. But let's get started with the history today. Here we go. So, uh, Har uh, the Fillmore or Western Edition has many different names, but really the Fillmore District or the Western Edition are the two ways that this neighborhood is most often referred to. The Fillmore is kind of the heart of the, of the business district. As you can see here, we're looking at Fillmore Street. And this was the central place for entertainment and for um, shops and restaurants. Of course, there's uh, Webster Street and Geary and other streets around it, but this was the heart of the Fillmore neighborhood. So when downtown San Francisco, um, after the gold, rot, gold rush got built out, people started looking around to what the closest uh, empty area was next to downtown in the Civic Center. And that happened to be the Fillmore neighborhood. By the 1880s, the Fillmore became a really bustling neighborhood, primarily Jewish American, but there was also small groups of Japanese Americans, African Americans, Filipino Americans, and other groups. So it was even from early on, quite a diverse neighborhood. So in 1906, of course, everyone knows the earthquake happened and most of downtown in the Civic Center uh, was wiped out by both earthquake and fire. And so the Fillmore luckily was, although slightly damaged, not did not get any fire and was the place where both the Civic Center and the stores downtown relocated and really became the heart of San Francisco for several years while downtown was being rebuilt. Of course, once it was rebuilt, uh, the government offices moved back to the Civic Center, shops reopened in downtown. And so the Fillmore merchants were trying to figure out a way to keep um, people coming back to the neighborhood. And they decided to focus on entertainment. And so San Francisco, I'm sorry, the Fillmore District very early on became one the heart of San Francisco's entertainment district. Also, the Fillmore Merchants Association decided to spend money and put these illuminated arches on every uh, intersection along Fillmore Street. And these arches created what people have said was one of the most illuminated boulevards west of the Mississippi. So not only did the arches light up, but then that um, ball in the middle also glowed as well. And these arches remained in place until World War II when they were taken down for scrap metal. Yes, um, and the, actually the neighborhood, probably from actually a lot of the 20th century was also a center of uh, many of the Japanese immigrants. This was considered a Japanese uh, area of San Francisco. And so, um, a number of things happened when Pearl Harbor happened. The first thing that happened that it was um, in this really diverse neighborhood is Japanese families were rounded up and um, sent to the concentration camps in different parts of the West. Uh, this is actually a picture taken at Tanferan, the uh, um, racetrack. And at the same time, there was a, a need for people to work in the shipyards that were being converted along, up and down the West Coast for the war effort. So a call went out to um, uh, a number of, uh, to all, all over the country and, and especially in the South, a lot of African-Americans from uh, particularly Louisiana and Texas came West, let me go back a little bit, um, and um, uh, 
in San Francisco, the only place there was available housing was the newly um, uh, abandoned uh, neighborhood in the Fillmore. Um, and so because there was already infrastructure for entertainment, uh, and because people brought their sort of musical interests with them, it, it almost immediately, there were uh, uh, clubs, there, there was a history of kind of jazz and clubs in San Francisco, but it sort of ex expanded with this new population that uh, moved to this neighborhood. Um, and uh, a number of photographers, including David Johnson here, um, started documenting it, a lot of them in the clubs. David Johnson actually came to the San Francisco Art Institute and was the first African-American to study with Ansel Adams. And in fact, when we discovered his work, we were thrilled because besides just documenting in the clubs, he was a, a fine artist and gave us examples of life on the street. This is a photograph taken, I'm gonna defer to my partner who's much better with dates, but I think this is in the late 40s. Is that right, Christine? I mean, uh, uh, 1947, Maybe. it's Fillmore mm -hmm. and uh, Post Street. Right. And then you look in the distance and you can see Geary and the Fillmore Auditorium is that kind of rectangular building on the far left. Um, then you have the synagogue and then you have the Scottish Rites Temple next to that on the right hand side. And at this point, there were still streetcars on uh, Fillmore Street. So David, after finishing the Art Institute, uh, which had a different name of that name, opened up a studio in the Fillmore. And um, uh, this was a time when, you know, brownies and so were not in everybody's hands. So people would go and um, have their photographs taken. And, and that was, he had a thriving studio going for a long time. But there was also, uh, because of these clubs, a number of people either self-taught or who had skills um, started photographing in the clubs. It's funny, we have very few pictures in churches. I think maybe it was in some of the black churches, uh, photography was not, was considered the dust tool. I'm still trying to work that out myself as a photographer. But um, this is um, a photographer with his, uh, um, what's his name, Elizabeth? We, we were never able to figure out for sure who this gentleman was. And, and I wanna add that our emails have just been posted in the chat section. Mm -hmm. If you recognize anyone in any of these photographs, um, please let us know. We've ID'd many of the major ones, um, but if like, for example, we've never been able to find out who this gentleman is. Um, and he's in one of the hotels in the Fillmore district uh, in the late 1940s, please email us. We, it is the way the book has been able to get updated and expanded. Um, Although he is identified in the book, actually it's J.B. Coleman, who had a right. studio. But oh, that's not, right, yes, you're right, yeah. sorry. Good, see, I'm always okay. relieved because Elizabeth has a much better memory than I do, so, <laughs> but I had to look it up. fast. <laughs> yeah. But what's interesting about it is that these photographers would go to the clubs with these four by five speed graphics, they would take photographs, go home, process the film and make prints, and then come back before, while the club was still open and sell the prints to the, the patrons and some of the uh, performers. So um, I, I actually moved to San Francisco in 19, so my family moved in 1964, and I spent a summer after having graduating from high school in San Francisco. And I remember that someone took me, said, do you wanna go to the black area of San Francisco? And I said, yes. And uh, it was a Friday night on the, in the Fillmore and it was jumping. And this was kind of probably the tail end of when there was this vibrant um, scene. But I remember there were a lot of people in the street. I knew nothing about his history, but I do have that experience sort of locked in my brain. And when I moved back to the Bay Area uh, to go to, to transfer to Berkeley in 1968, I could not find this neighborhood because it, as it existed, it, didn't, it was not um, visibly there. So um, uh, my good friend, Mildred Howard, who's an artist um, uh, said, I want you to go to the shoeshine parlor that's on Fillmore Street uh, because I, A, uh, I'm doing some work about shoeshine parlors, but also I think you really like it. And so I went to Red Powell Sh Shine Parlor, um, which was located in the first block south of Geary on uh, Fillmore. And in his uh, walls were all kinds of photographs 
of people from the community. It's funny, you see behind him, there's pictures of Sitting Bull and Bobby Kennedy and Joseph Stalin and Bobby Freeman, who was a local uh, R&B musician. And I got really excited when I said, wow, this is incredible. Can I photograph? And he said, absolutely not. And um, basically told me to leave. And I, th I think Elizabeth had the exact same uh, experience when she was working at the Fillmore. So I'd like to think that um, Mildred's brother, Billy, who knew Red said, well, just tell him you know me and that I went back soon, but it probably was, a, it may have been even six months because I was involved in all the things. And when I went back, he was gone and the walls were bare. And so for a long time, I kept asking people what happened. And then I got hired by the redevelopment agency uh, who was attempting to sort of uh, do research to do a jazz preservation district because this whole history had been erased. And I remember asking people all the time, what happened? And I was across the street at the New Chicago Barbershop and Reggie Pettis, the barber said, oh, those pictures are in my back room. And we heard finally the story was that Red had a stroke not too long after both Elizabeth and I had um, uh, visited him. And so though I think his son tried to keep the shop going, but um, the, the landlord came in after he sort of, it was not open anymore and um, it was, take, was taking the photographs down. Reggie saw that um, and before he could throw them out and negotiate it to sort of save the pictures. And it was interesting about this is in the African-American community and other places, the barbers, uh, shoe shine parlors, beauty parlors are the visual archivists that they, that's usually where a lot of things are, are, um, are both saved and collected. And here's a picture of Reggie in his barbershop with some of those photographs, some of the photographs that are in the book. So he was, when I, when Reggie told me that, I was thrilled and he was excited that I was excited. And um, so first I was able, he let me use them for a report that I was doing for the research. And then my friend Rupert Jenkins at the San Francisco Art Commission said, well, you know, you need to show these. And so I um, uh, started, some of them were framed and in really good shape and some of them were not in very good shape. And at that point I was teaching analog darkroom photography and I think I'd taken a couple of digital classes but never, I didn't use it so I didn't know it. And I remember a student who used to help me with that um, said, well, you know, you need to do this yourself. So when I kind of was involved in a project I was invested in, I learned uh, to digitally restore and it's going to change my whole photographic process and practice. So here's one of the example of one of the photographs and um, through the magic of digital manipulation I was able to restore it and my idea there's a sort of controversy about among um, some archivists about whether things should be resolved uh, remain as they were found but I, it was real important to me that I wanted the photographs to look as they did when the photographers would come back to try to sell them you know when it looked like in the dark room so I was actually thrilled that kind of history could be reconstructed and what would happen was it turns out red had a collection but then when a lot of the businesses and clubs closed um, of many of the people gave their images to Red. So he had, a, he had archives from a variety of people. And then as we continued, we were able to find more of them. So the way that we found a lot of people was, um, so I I've, was born in 1964 and would occasionally drive through the Fillmore with my parents on the way to Sears, which is up on the top of Geary and Masonic and always wondered why there is these big empty lots. Um, and that was answered when I got hired by Bill Graham to be the day manager and uh, historian of the Fillmore Auditorium in 1986. And he asked me to write a booklet about uh, the building, which was built in 1912. And by researching and writing that booklet, I became aware of this much richer history pre-Bill Graham which was the African-American um, history of the Fillmore in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s. Um, so when I started doing that booklet for Bill, I quickly found out that there's very little at the time, this is 1986, uh, at uh, the obvious places like uh, San Francisco Public Library or California Historical Society. 
So I would simply walk around the neighborhood and start talking to people in the street that looked old enough to have lived this history. And by doing that, was able to start meeting people, interviewing them and uncovering um, their personal archives. And it was in 1997 when I got hired at KQED to help on the film or documentary that Lou and I met and we found out that we were both doing the same thing and decided to join forces. So the KQED documentary came out first and then Lou and I um, did the book and the first edition came out in uh, 2006. Um, and it was incredible. I mean, these photographs had been sitting in people's houses and basements and stashed away in boxes for decades and just it was amazing to uncover them and Lou, as you can see, lovingly restored them. This is a photograph from the Booker T. Washington Hotel, which is one of the Black End hotels of uh, uh, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, and uh, we think it was a breakfast. There's a couple things I love about this picture. Her white gloves neatly folded on her purse, the rug in this space, um, and the fact that next to her is uh, Robert Lee, who we saw a lot of photographs of and who I tried to contact. We have, we have that story a lot and he kept being busy and then died and I never heard his story. But next to him is Don Newcomb, who was originally a pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers and then the Los Angeles Dodgers. And next to him is Joe Perry, who was a running back for the 49ers. So this was a, a, um, a gathering of, of heavy hitters in San Francisco. I also love the man, gentleman on the right and his Argyle socks. So, so we sort of, yeah, go ahead. So, so what would happen is that only the most famous African American musicians could play uh, in the downtown clubs, like at the Fairmont and other places, but they weren't allowed to stay in the hotels. So they'd have to come back after playing for a only white audience. It was very segregated. And they would come back to the Fillmore and stay in either the Manor Plaza or the Booker T. Washington Hotel, which were the two big hotels in the neighborhood. And at both um, venues had uh, little cocktail uh, lounges downstairs um, with, where they would have these uh, oftentimes breakfasts because by the time you got back from playing and hanging out and cleaning up, then it was time for breakfast. So that's what that photo we think is. And they, this, these were gathering places for, for sort of the African-American community all over the Bay Area. Here is um, uh, Duke Ellington being incredibly charming as he was known to do. Um, I think this is at the Manor Plaza too. Yes, with uh, ma many ladies surrounding him. Yeah. And this is interesting. This is Louis Jordan, who's the second from the uh, right uh, in front of a poster because he was performing in town and he's there with his wife. And the gentleman in the middle is Little Tiny, who, of course, who was a DJ in the area. And the couple on the left were the owners of the uh, Manor Plaza Hotel. And um, they, I think their daughter yep. gave us that. Their names are the McCoys and they also had uh, a venue called the Primalon Roller Skating Rink and Ballroom. So most of the time during the day, it was a roller skating rink and then a couple nights out of the week, um, they would have bands play. This is actually an image that David Johnson took at the Primalon Ballroom. As this was, uh, I think was in band. Yeah. What I think is interesting about this picture, you can kind of see that the audience was integrated and this is like a, both uh, an opportunity in the Bay Area and also a, an issue because a lot of the police were not happy with the fact that there was sort of race mixing and romance. And I think what's, what's really interesting about these images, you get an idea about life. Um, this was uh, uh, Jack's which is one of the original uh, bars. And I love that the guy on the left has his Eisenhower jacket on and it sort of reflects the fact that a lot of these people came because of the great migration in uh, uh, during the middle of the 20th century. So Jack's was the first um, jazz club to open in the film where it was on Sutter um, and uh, it opened in 1932 and it was, uh, 
run by owned and run by an African American couple. Which was pretty amazing because the, the African American population at the time was pretty was not very uh, high. It it actually moved um, to Geary and Fillmore and is now the Boom Boom uh, Room. Gentleman on the right is Frank Jackson, who is a, a pianist who was always very uh, from the area the the era who was always very supportive of us. In fact, he played the first time I showed photographs that I had collected, which I thought that we've had a number of circumstances where people in the in the uh, from the period and in the book have been able to play when we have done events or showed um, uh, the work in different places. Here he is in a group called the Four Naturals, which seemed to have a revolving uh, cast of characters, uh, but they had a series of photographs um, with the pianist in front of this kind of abstracted, stylized piano. Frank just passed not too long ago. And, in fact, I, I was able to see him play at Yoshi's on his 90th birthday, which was really thrilling. This is a, a band we were never able to identify, but they're celebrating the release of this record. And so there's a number of things going on here, both the way they're dressed, the ads on the wall behind them kind of also say some, and the fact he's holding a, a 78 um, uh, record. So there was really only one record label um, that came out of the Fillmore that we're aware of, and that was a label called Rhythm Records. And it was started by a Jewish American guy named David Rosenbaum, who also had a record store just down the street from Jacks of Sutter called Rhythm Records. So when we first got this photograph from David Johnson, um, it was taken in 1947, um, he told us that it was the Melrose Record Shop. And the Melrose Record Shop, um, of and everyone has re uh, read I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings is uh, actually talked about in that book. And Maya, Maya Angelou was a clerk at the record store. So we just assumed, of course, David knew his photograph and that was a uh, Melrose record shop on Fillmore Street. Well, one of the cool things about doing this project for so long is as the internet became more accessible and materials started to appear, appear on the internet, we're able to go back and um, start checking into some of the questions that we had about uh, dates and people and things like that. Um, because initially when we started the researching in the 80s, of course, there was no, no such thing as the internet. So I had been trying to find the Sun Reporter newspaper archive, which was the uh, newspaper that came out of the Fillmore District starting in 1946. Um, it was a weekly newspaper, but no one seemed to have back copies. And then finally in 2015, I read online that UC Berkeley had scanned their collection of um, the Sun Reporters. And while it still hadn't been digitized at least uh, they had it on microfilm. And so I did an inner library loan and sat at the Ojai Library. I live down in uh, central Southern California now and looked at every single page of the Sun Reporter from their archive, which started 1951 and ran to the present day. So I read from 1951 to 1960. And it was in, in doing that that I found out that in fact, this was not Melrose Record Shop as David had thought, but it was David Rosenbaum's first record store uh, rhythm records and it was also he had a record label that ran out of that store as well. Well, well briefly the, there's a, in the window there's a sign for uh, a record that was a rhythm and blues hit by, uh, called Bilbo is Dead which was about a, uh, a senator and governor from Mississippi who was an arch segregationist and when he passed um, it was a, a big rhythm and blues hit, which I thought was interesting, also sort of dating it. The other thing is you can see, you did not go out uh, in this neighborhood without dressing. And I have to say, after looking at all these guys with their Stetson hats, I had to get a couple of them myself. It's, and that was one of the, the sort of uh, influences that it had on me. This is another photograph by uh, David Johnson. We think maybe at the Primalon also.
And, you know, so, you know, there was a variety of musical tastes that people brought from the South and different parts of the country, including rhythm and blues and jazz. Um, and as taste changed, the uh, record output and the, the musical styles um, changed along with it. This is actually by Frank Jackson. I love this because there's a picture of two musicians early in the morning, probably much earlier than they're used to being up. And I, I think it sort of shows in their body language. I, I love that the picture of them coming out early for some reason in Fillmore Street. So this is another photograph. Um, it's of Eartha Kit and some neighborhood kids that we didn't know much of, more about that, that than that, that it was Eartha with a handful of neighborhood uh, boys from the Fillmore. And it was another instance of where reading all those Sun reporters paid off because I found ads um, for this event. So I found out that it was at the Champagne Supper Club it took place right before Christmas in the early 1950s. And what it was, was a celebration of the Sun Reporter uh, newspaper boys um, and kind of a Christmas party for them. And so every year the Sun Reporter would have these events for the, their newspaper boys and actually very famous musicians would play. Teddy Edwards was also on the bill uh, for this event. Um, and you can see a boy on the uh, left-hand side of the screen in a little white string tie. And that, he actually was not a newspaper boy. That's Danny Duncan, who we were able to interview and told us about this uh, day as well. And he said that, um, this is one of Lewis's photographs, and this is Danny in his house in the Fillmore district where he's lived since he was a kid. Um, he, had, he was kind of a, a neighborhood celebrity because he was very active in the theater as a, as starting as a young boy. Um, and to this day, in fact, uh, he's working currently on a play about his mother's um, after hours club, which she had in the basement of their home. So it's really great to, again, see, have seen this photograph for, gosh, almost... 15, 20 years, and finally be able to have the story behind the photograph. And this has been happening to us since the beginning that we get, you know, well, there's a couple of things. Memory we know is a, is a movable target, but we, the stories, uh, people, whenever we show the work, someone says, oh, that's my auntie, or we hear some kind of a story and that's, uh, that kind of connects someone we've been looking at. This is, this is Danny and his um, uh, siblings growing up Here's a picture of him at the um, Raphael Will School in 1951. It's really interesting that uh, about the same age as I was growing up in Seattle with a similar history and a very similar demographic uh, of people, you know, the kids of people who had migrated um, west. And you can see by 1951 that there are uh, the, the Asians and most of the Japanese in the neighborhood, some of them had returned, you can see. But in this is Danny's mother who had an actually after hours place in her house on, I believe it was Sutter Street. And that's partly what he's working on this uh, musical and play about. So this is an interesting photograph that um, uh, we were really interested in what, A, that what happened um, when the Japanese were displaced and then some of them came back. And what was interesting and illuminating to us about this one is that here is a, a wedding party and you can see that the wedding party is pretty diverse, uh, filled with people from the community. And I'm not gonna remember his name, but I remember a playwright who teaches at Berkeley wrote a play um, that originally was at ACT called After the War. And he said this photograph, in, and it was kind of about what happened in some of the boarding houses um, uh, when the Japanese came back and kind of the both tensions and the way people way people came together. We've interviewed people from the neighborhood who said as young people they would stand outside of Jimbo's Bop City and um, listen to the music and so there was a sort of blending of culture that happened in the neighborhood which is I think at its best something that San Francisco has always had. And thank you to my former KQED colleague, June Willette, who says it's Philip Khan Gotande is the thank playwright. He um, was a former and, colleague and, of mine. Yes, thank you. And and that was at uh, Jackson's, uh, Jackson's Nook was the, yeah. the club. Okay. Ah, great. 
So one of the people who um, actually had an international uh, hit from San Francisco, a lot of musicians kind of incubated here, but a lot of them had to go elsewhere to make their reputation. But Saunders King actually had a, um, a hit that was uh, known internationally. And here's a photograph of him. He is, um, uh, he's got, you know, the, the, been in the, he was in the Bay Area for a long time and, um, his uh, daughters are actually uh, both uh, were connected to Moad. Uh, one still is, and one's now uh, in um, Southern California. Uh, but they uh, were all, again, like many of the families, very generous to us in terms of giving us information uh, from the period about and about their father. Here he is a little later in life. His son-in-law was Carlos Santana, and I think there's an interview of them talking together about the blues, um, and uh, those kinds of stories are always really interesting to us. So that one of the clubs in the area was called the Gold Mirror, and um, at some point, uh, a woman, Laola King, who had, uh, who actually had grown up on a reservation in um, Oklahoma but whose African-American father had moved to LA and she joined him at one point, I think in a restaurant and then moved to the Bay Area and uh, eventually bought the gold mirror and changed it, this name to the blue mirror. And it was um, a, another one of these incredible gathering places where a lot of people showed up. And the, one of the story was that I had, people had told me about Leola and I, and I think we both t contacted her and she was very nice, but she said, I'm sorry, all of my photographs were lost in a fire. I have nothing for you. So when the first edition of the book came out in 2006, she saw it and really loved it and said, um, my archives exist and they are yours. Um, and so uh, she lived in the, still lived in the neighborhood. At one point, she was uh, very wealthy and had a lot of property and, and had clubs all over. Um, and all of that was wiped out, which is partly why she was both suspicious and bitter about what it was happening and about the history. But it was, it was, they were wiped, her, uh, her fortune was wiped out because of the redevelopment agency taking yes. all of her properties and not giving her compensation. And she fought that till the day that she died. Um, but one thing I want to point about the gold mirror and other clubs in the Fillmore is that you know San Francisco has this reputation of being very liberal and accepting and while that was true to a point um, many of the clubs and restaurants in the Fillmore district up until uh, after world uh, or up until World War II were actually segregated and the Gold Mirror is is one of those clubs it was not integrated until Leola King uh, took it over in the uh, in 1954. Um, and that's the same with the Fillmore Auditorium and, and other yeah. venues in the neighborhood. So this Leola, that's Leola, a uh, second from the right. Um, and it, 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 again, it sort of points out that people were um, very well put together. They were having a really great time. And so it was, it was interesting to sort of see how uh, uh, the people were sort of put it, just what they looked like and how they were carrying themselves. So this was also a place where people in town would gather. This, this is the Mills brothers singing with their father, um, which we thought was really interesting and, and uh, that it was kind of about family and that this would be the, one of the places they would feel comfortable enough to do that. And you can see here's Louis Armstrong and his uh, wife and other people hanging out there. If you go to our website, there's a link to a film clip of Lowell Folsom playing at one of Leola King's Blue Monday nights. She had, uh, she featured the blues every Monday night. And it's one of the very few uh, pieces of footage that w that is known um, from this uh, time period in the Fillmore district. So if you go to our website, harlemofthewestsf.com, you can check out the inside of the blue mirror during its hey, heyday and watch an amazing clip of Lowell and his band playing. Here's Lena Horn in the blue mirror. Edward G. Robinson signing autographs. 
And here's Leola with her mother in a mansion that she had on Scott Street, which of course she also lost during redevelopment. But uh, Leola was incredibly beautiful up until the end and really a strong force. We, it was that once she finally decided we were okay, um, she was always very welcoming to her house and really supportive of our efforts to kind of expand the book. Here she is with Josephine Baker. I remember she asked me, so Josephine's on the left. She said, can you make that gentleman in the middle disappear? <laughs> she wanted to just have the picture with her by herself. And here she is actually at the, I think what this is in the Texas Playhouse with Wesley Johnson, who was the club owner. And this was a, um, I think a party for uh, Lottie, uh, Lottie the Body, the blonde on the right. We'll you'll see some more about her who was about to take off on a tour. But what we, you know, what, what these photographs really show is just how kind of, uh, who was hanging out and what they were doing um, at night. And here's a picture of her, uh, toward the end. Somebody uh, had a question about uh, other burlesque performers in the Fillmore. And um, there are some photographs of other burlesque performers in the book. Um, Lottie the Body uh, Claiborne was probably the most famous of all the burlesque performers. Um, and we had tried to find her for quite some time and we just no one seemed to know where she had gone to. And again, the internet playing an uh, important part in connecting us. We finally tracked her down to Detroit of all places. And yeah. Lou and I got on a plane and flew there in 2015. And we were able to interview her and she gave us some photographs from her collection, which uh, that iconic one of her jumping over T-Bone Walker's head at this Champagne Supper Club um, was probably the most incredible of all the um, photographs. She was the lead uh, performer at the Champagne Supper Club and performed there for a number of years. Um, many of the, the bigger clubs had uh, dancing girls as part of their yeah. evening events. There would be a whole review. And, and in fact, some of the movie theaters would both have uh, you know, multiple features as well as live music. Here she is in Detroit. We, we actually were delayed uh, meeting with her because she was being feted by the International Burlesque Association in Las Vegas. So we had to meet with her later. She was very, very nice and very generous again and really liked what we were doing. And recently just passed away. So rest in peace, Lottie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is the Club Flamingo that was a, a purchased by Wesley Johnson, and he changed the, it to the Texas Playhouse. And it was interesting. It was a, because a lot of people migrated from Texas. This is one of the hangouts for people from Texas and a kind of celebration of Texas culture. This Wesley second from the left. And here he is. He was actually known for this uh, 10 gallon white Stetson. And they didn't have bands at uh, the Texas Playhouse. Uh, as you saw there, Wesley had this kind of patter going all night. Uh, he was kind of the MC and he would play uh, records and people would just hang out. Um, but there was never live music at the Texas Playhouse. Right. But you can see like this, this mural on the wall celebrating Texas musicians, Eddie Taylor, Teddy Wilson, Ivory Joe Hunter, uh, John Hinton and Saunders King, who was originally from Texas. And you get, so you see the du jukebox and you get to see how the club was appointed. I mean, these places were really kind of palaces and, and you know, uh, we, um, I'll show you some more. It's interesting, his son, one day Elizabeth and I were doing a kind of tour of the neighborhood and someone, you know, very nicely, but sort of kept saying, you know, that's not right when we'd say something. So we asked him later and it turned out it was Wesley Johnson uh, Jr. The his son. The third. Yeah, the third, right, we gotta get that right. Um, and Wesley Johnson III had actually gone to pharmacy school at UCSF. And when they needed money for tuition, they took many of the, the dollars down and the silver dollars that were at the bar and used that to pay the tuition. But you can see it's absolutely packed with these yeah. Yeah. patrons just dressed incredibly. I'm just so jealous of, of the clothes. And it just looks like so much fun. 
We yeah. were told by uh, one of our interview subjects that he would leave the house on Friday night and not go home until Sunday afternoon because there was so much going on in the Fillmore district. There was more than 20 clubs, plus you had the after hours clubs and the clubs in people's basement. Um, so it was pretty amazing place to be. And because of the musicians from across, it was, it was known, people knew about it all over the country. So the, this is um, with one of his, uh, Jake, I think was his bartender. And Pete. the other thing we know, Pete, that there were all these pretty amazing paintings on the walls. And it turned out they were actually painted by um, an artist who also designed the Paramount Theater in Oakland and I think parts of Fisherman's Wharf. And, and one- Fisherman's and, Wharf sign. Yeah, the fire, okay. Well, one day, I think when we, we got a message from someone saying, you know, those paintings that were up um, at the Texas Playhouse, I have them in my room. And it turns out when the Texas Playhouse was closed by redevelopment, um, I think the Ukrainian contractor kind of saw them and said, oh, maybe I can salvage these. And when he brought them back to Daly City or wherever he was living, his wife said, you can't do that. This is culture and history. We should give them to our neighbors who are displaced from the Fillmore. So they had actually sat in um, the Willie O'Ree's um, uh, room and, uh, and we're in pretty good shape. And he let us use them in a number of exhibits. We sort of lost track of where they are now. Um, but uh, my friend, uh, Antoinette Brichard, uh, recognized the gentleman on the left as her uncle. And he talked about, he, he told her about coming in uh, from Berkeley to the Fillmore every weekend with his sweetheart. And here he is in front of the Lionel Hampton painting. And she, there's a piece that she wrote, there's a remembrance of him and his remembrances of this time. So that idea of history expanding has continued. And I think the artist's name was John O'Shanahan, but I'm not 100% sure. I was just trying to look in our book if where that was, but it's in the book <laughs> somewhere. Okay. So someone who spent a lot of time in the Bay Area was Billie Holiday. And um, in fact, my, my uh, father, well, my family friend, the Collins, is Dan Collins was a, um, a dentist in the area. And he took, he was, she was, he was her dentist. And she had told him that she had never really had a man tell her he loved her who really meant it. I think she'd had some issues with men, but I think this is a photograph by Jerry Stoll, who was also very generous to give us um, work for the book, who was the official photographer for, for uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival, but also photographed in many of the clubs. And here she is with Mel Torme in the, um, is this the Manor Plaza, I believe? No, it's uh, the uh, Amon's so, Breakfast Nook, uh, which okay. was in the basement. It was where the New Orleans, uh, New Orleans Swing Club was, um, and okay. they took it over after uh, the owner of that club got busted by the IRS and thrown in San Quentin. <laughs> it's interesting that th sort of these w this work sort of got me collecting a lot of photographs of her. That one of the things I noticed that she never looked the same in any of the photographs, and um, so I have a, a collection now of about sixty images of hers. Um, partly coming from this time. Here she is with Wesley. And uh, it's interesting in the background, there's a, uh, a uh, poster for Tapper's Dance Hall, which was in Richmond. So, you know, there was a scene in Richmond and Oakland and in other parts of the Bay Area um, that sort of came along with the people that arrived. The other thing was she loved that dog. And when the dog died, she had the dog buried with the mink coat that you saw her with before. And the, the, one of the things, there's always fellows that hang out at the Burger King on Fillmore, and a couple of them told me that it didn't matter what kind of shape she is, when she walked down the street and passed, everybody's mouth would drop open because she was so incredibly beautiful, which is, it was true, as you can see in the photographs. So this is the New Orleans Swing Club that I was just talking about um, I think I said that the picture previously. Was Another one, sort of a connection between, uh, like the Texas Playhouse, connecting to the Louisiana roots of a lot of the people that transplanted. Well, and also the Barbary Coast, because some of the club owners um, in the Barbary Coast, which is in the uh, kind of near North Beach, where North Beach mm -hmm. and uh, uh, downtown meet, and that was really the first jazz district of San Francisco in the teens and early 20s. 
um, some of those club owners, um, as the Fillmore uh, became more lively and had more jazz clubs, actually uh, opened clubs in the Fillmore district. Um, and the New Orleans Swing Club was one of those clubs that had a couple of the guys from the Barbary Coast involved in, in that club. But they were also catering to the fact that much of their audience in the neighborhood was from that area. Here's a right. picture of Lionel Hampton wearing Wesley Johnson's uh, Stetson hat. And next on the left is um, uh, Charles Sullivan, who is called the mayor of, of uh, Fillmore, and, and Elizabeth will talk more about him. Between um, them is uh, Ralph J. Gleason, who was a, a columnist who wrote originally about jazz and then sort of transition to writing about uh, the Fillmore, you know, the psychedelic uh, time, but he was an incredible uh, music writer. And next to him is Jimmy Lyons, who is one of the founders of the, on the uh, right of Lionel, one of the founders of the Monterey Jazz Club, the Monterey Jazz Festival. And then Fatso Berry's on the far right, and he was a, D, a very popular DJ on the radio. Um, so Charles Sullivan, uh, owned quite a few clubs in the Fillmore district, as well as he had the concession for many of the jukeboxes in um, bars. Uh, he owned a liquor store. Um, you can see there's this little fanzine that the New Orleans Swing Club uh, put out, and this is a little clipping um, from it. So Charles was the one that approached the owner of the Fillmore Auditorium. Um, who had a clothing store in the first floor of the Fillmore Auditorium. And he didn't like the sound of the roller skating rink that was above him because at that time, uh, the Fillmore Auditorium was actually uh, called the Ambassador Rollerium. And it was a segregated roller skating rink, only whites could go there. So the venue was converted back to a dance hall and then Charles Sullivan approached the owner and asked if he could begin booking African-American acts at uh, the venue. And so in 1952, he began, he began to do that. And that was the first time since the building was built in 1912 that anyone could come to the Fillmore and uh, see live music. And Charles uh, built kind of an empire and became one of the largest promoters of African-American music west of the Mississippi. So he would start uh, these uh, tours that would start up in Seattle area, work their way down uh, through in Portland. Um, he used the Crystal Ballroom in Portland as another place to have his bands play. And then down into San Francisco at the Fillmore Auditorium. So in 1965, when Bill Graham was working with the San Francisco Mime Troupe and wanted uh, to have a fundraiser because they had been busted and they needed some money for lawyers, he tried to find a venue to have a band night for a benefit and everyone turned him down. And Charles Sullivan was the only um, club owner in the entire San Francisco area that would allow him to use his dance hall license and it was such a success, it was December 10th, 1965, such a success that um, Bill asked to do more. And so that's how Bill got his start, is through Charles Sullivan being generous and allowing him to use the Fillmore Auditorium um, under his dance hall license. And so what would happen is that for a while they shared the venue, Charles would book his bands, uh, Bill would book the hippie acts um, on the off nights. And often you would see the crossover because Bill would ask some of the bands that Charles had booked playing for a predominantly African-American audience to stay over and open for some of the hippie acts. So that's why you see Miles Davis or you see uh, uh, Little Richard or other people opening for the Grateful Dead or Janis Joplin. And so unfortunately, Charles Sullivan was murdered and they never sol solved his murder. That was in 1966, November 1966. Um, and that's when Bill took over the Fillmore Auditorium um, completely. But Bill always uh, acknowledged Charles as the person that gave him his start.
The other thing, this is actually probably a poster from a, 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 a show, Little Richard, that Charles Sullivan uh, promoted. And it's interesting, we, uh, John Goddard, who had Village Music in Mill Valley, talked about taking the bus in when he was a teenager to see this show and being both fascinated and a little frustrated by the fact that Little Richard had this left-handed guitarist who was probably even more flamboyant than Little Richard. In fact, we heard that Little Richard actually fire, fired Jimi Hendrix because he was too weird, which is the height of irony. But uh, we love these, like all these kind of stories are great. The other thing I was going to say about this poster is I remember seeing this style poster in both Seattle where I grew up and in the East. And what happens is the bands would have uh, the, the poster with the information and then they would plug in at the top the venue and the date. Um, so uh, you could see pictures like this for the Apollo and for theaters, you know, in different places. And I thought that was interesting and it really sort of looked familiar to me. When I saw it. Um, someone just asked about the uh, KQED film war documentary. Unfortunately, KQED uh, decided not to uh, renew the um, narration and music rights to the film, so they don't air it any longer. But you can buy a DVD on eBay. Uh, Peter Stein, the uh, filmmaker, is selling the remaining DVDs on eBay. So if you type in the film or the hidden neighborhoods of San Francisco on eBay, I think it's eBay or Amazon, I can't remember actually now. But what one of those two places, you'll find it and you can buy the and our, uh, and our emails are listed if you have trouble with it just write us um write liz she's but no you could write either one of us <laughs> oh this great is, i'm gonna get inundated just giving her a bet but uh, i'm just gonna briefly we we're getting toward the end but um the other thing is all these amazing stories my friend janet alvarado um uh, who's her father came to Sa the san francisco from the philippines sort of in the first wave in the 30s of, of bachelors and he got a job in the Presidio in the kitchen and lived in the Western edition and bought a camera and taught himself to photograph and photographed a lot of the Filipino and, and um, uh, Latinx sort of uh, culture and people all over California, but also photographed in the clubs in the Fillmore. And here he is with his speed graphic. That was the camera of choice. The, the other thing about the speed graphic is it's not like an iPhone, it, you, it's, it, it's big, it makes beautiful images, but you have to really know what you're doing. I love this picture of a kind of house party which showing the kind of uh, combining of cultures. And I love the wallpaper in that, the space. This is on uh, doing Thanksgiving in the, in the uh, Presidio. And this is uh, Vernon Alley, who actually was part of a, a family of musicians. And he was actually discovered by, was it Lionel Hampton? Lionel Hampton in 1939. Lionel was playing at the uh, World's World Fair, Fair um, on Treasure Island and came to Jackson Sutter um, one night and saw Vernon play and asked him to be part of the band. So when uh, Lionel left San Francisco, Vernon went with him for, I think, almost two years. And he actually came to the first time I showed this work at the um, uh, the sort of veterans building in San Francisco. So I met him, but he died very soon after that. But we also met his brother, Eddie Alley, who was a drummer, um, who was again, another person who was very supportive of this project and gave us photographs. Um, here's a, his picture with his wife, who was really beautiful and they both were great couple and uh this is their wedding day and then here's a picture of them at the celebration of the integration of the musicians union that that was uh probably in the 90s i think and he was a really wonderful uh man and very supportive of um our efforts so probably one of the best known we'll, i'll try to move it along a bit of the clubs after our plays was jimbo's bop city and uh, if you read the book, you can hear the whole history, but it was on post, right? And- Post uh, and Buchanan. Yeah, Buchanan, yes. And um, I think it was originally, well, it was originally a club started by, that Charles Sullivan had gotten for um, Slam Stewart, who was a great Slim musician. Slim Gaylord. Slim, yes, his partner, Slim Gaylord, who was a great musician, not a great businessman. Um, and it was a, a Waffle House also. And I think um, a, it was taken over by um, 
uh, Jimbo God, Edwards. Thank you, Jimbo. Um, and uh, he had like, you know, a bass and a drum and people started asking if they could play. And so after hours, people that had gigs in the city would come and play. This is like a, a, one of the tickets to it. And uh, we, here's some pictures of it in its original location. And so like, the, one of the official photographers, go ahead, was, is um, Steve Jackson Jr. Um, who we also met. There's a long story of how Elizabeth had heard about him and finally we were able to get in touch and here we are. What happened was we had to pass the, she had to pass the test and drink some of his uh, moon, uh, rot gut moonshine. And I think when she downed it and was still standing, um, he thought we were all right and opened up the sort of door behind with, with shelves full of four by five negatives he had taken uh, it, mainly in Jimbo's Bob City. So he let us use, here's a picture of Jimbo with what most bass players said was a horrible bass so they would usually bring their own. This is a pretty amazing photograph. Uh, in the back, you see uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis sitting at a piano and Milt Jackson and a variety of other people are in this um, sort of same thing. I'm probably sure some, a lot of the clubs, uh, people came after having their gigs and were hanging out at Bob City. And from the photographs, we thought it must've been a really big place. And it turned out that it actually, the building Victorian it was in was moved from post around the corner to Fillmore. And uh, it, was, it was the original location of um, Marcus Books and was not a very big space. This is one of the few uh, attempts he did using color where I think he double exposed by accident. But um, Elizabeth can talk about the posters uh, and the, I mean, the murals in the background. And it really, you know, it's the same thing. You could see people were having a really good time. It was interesting to see the variety and diversity of people who would hang out there. So the murals were done by, the first murals um, were done by Harry Smith, who you see here, um, created the anthology of folk music, experimental filmmaker, artist. So he was living over in Berkeley, was a massive jazz fan and kept coming over to the Fillmore district to hear music. And eventually he was spending more time in, uh, the Fillmore than he was over in Berkeley. So he got an apartment above, initially above Jackson's Nook. But at some point he became good friends with uh, Jimbo Edwards and Jimbo actually became his patron. Um, Harry was consistently broke. And so Jimbo let him move into an apartment that was above Bob City. And in exchange for uh, rent and free food downstairs at the Waffle House, um, Harry painted the entire space in the back of uh, the Waffle House, which was Bop City, with these beautiful, colorful murals. Um, and so he also did some uh, experimental art with uh, jazz musicians here at uh, MoMA downtown, um, bands would play and he would create art uh, that was inspired by the music that he was hearing. Um, same with his films. He would often listen to jazz and create these very experimental films that were inspired by the music that he was hearing. He eventually moved to New York to the Chelsea Hotel and actually hung out with Patti Smith and uh, many of the people there. So he has, there's a, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles has a huge archive of his work. Yes. Here's another example. Someone's asking, when did these places, there's Harry with his uh, murals just after he had finished them. Someone asked, uh, when did all these places become integrated and how long did it take? So. There were integrated clubs in the film world, like I said, Jacks of Sutter in 1932, but most of the clubs did not become integrated until the mass migration of African-Americans into uh, the Fillmore neighborhood during World War II. And in many cases, be partly because that was the only place it was housing, but also because of how covenants and restrictions, that was one of the few places in San Francisco where African-Americans could actually move. Yes. So here's a picture of inside um, Jimbo's Bob City, um, sort of uh, gives a, a, a really good sort of sense of its atmosphere. And again, this is probably at three or four in the morning. These are patrons. 
Here's uh, uh, Chico Hamilton playing. Johnny Mathis, who was originally from San, who is from San Francisco, uh, singing. Here is uh, Jimbo with Herb Cain. We heard that the well, you'll see. Um, here's Louis Louis Armstrong and his wife in front of this poster for of him a mural for him. That that Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack came, came out. This is. Um, one of Duke Ellington's saxophonists, with Gonzalez. Paul Gonzalez. Paul Gonzalez jamming um, uh, at Jimbo's, probably after a gig. This is an interesting picture. This is Teddy Edwards with his girlfriend and somebody else. And we heard that the gentleman on the right uh, with the saxophone and the kind of look lost um, had tried to sit in during one of the jam sessions. And the, the sort of rule was if you couldn't cut it, um, you would be asked to leave and, and sometimes not so subtle way. Sometimes the, the drummer would throw the cymbal at your feet. And supposedly he's just been asked to leave. And that's that. So the, there's a number of things going on here, which I think is really interesting. And this is Julie, Julie, Tri, was it Judy or Julie Tristano, the ex-wife of Lenny Tristano. And we were interested in this photograph because in the, firstly in the 50s and uh, 40s and 50s, um, you, might, you had to really be able to play to be able to sit in if you were a woman because women were not. Although we do have some pictures of all women bands during the middle of, of World War II when a lot of the musicians were off at war. Um, so that did exist, but um, uh, we just thought that was an interesting uh, sort of narrative. Here's Chet Baker who was hanging out at, at Jimbo's. He'd uh, escape. After yeah. he was at the station at the Presidio and he'd escape uh, after lights went out and come down to the clubs. Here's Max Roach. And we think maybe Ben Webster, Max Roach on the left and it, Ben Webster, it looks like um, sec, third, third in from the left. And again, as I said, the, we think that Sammy Davis, well, we know Sammy Davis did, but we think Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack would hang out there. We also know that um, Jack Kerouac makes reference to the Fillmore and to Jimbo's, and um, it was also a hangout, probably because of it being open uh, for some of the beat writers. And here is uh, Char Charlie Parker at Jimbo's. We understand that the only time that Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker, who at that point were probably at odds because they were uh, he would, the beboppers were trying to rebel against sort of swing, um, but that the Jimbo's was the only time they were in the same space at the same time. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but there's a number of things going on. You notice on the chair by him is a, a Ezra Charles, who was a boxer of the time. A lot of the clubs would have the names of musicians and athletes, and if they showed up, then you'd have to get up and give them the chair that had their, your na their name on it. So uh, meanwhile, uh, I think I said there was sort of, it was, was not beyond the notice of the authorities and the police that these were venues and this neighborhood was a place where sort of race mixing was going on and some people were not into that. And so Bob City got uh, raided as well as some of the other clubs. And this was sort of, uh, as the redevelopment agency was sort of uh, mounting this effort to modernize this neighborhood in quotes. I said. So there the was sign. a lot of, there was a lot of um, articles starting in the late 1940s in both the Chronicle and the Examiner painting this picture of the neighborhood, as you can see here uh, in this redevelopment pamphlet, as a blighted slum that, you know, these children should be saved from. And you see these words over and over, and they're kind of trying to make a uh, white San Francisco be afraid of the Fillmore neighborhood. But as you can see from these photographs that we've just shown you, which were taken at the exact time that these articles in the Chronicling and the Examiner were, were painting these ridiculous portraits of the neighborhood, uh, the, the photographs tell a completely different story. And it was just really uh, getting people ready for what was about to be unleashed on the neighborhood. And the first building came down in the Fillmore in 1953. Um, and that was when they 
uh, took Geary Street, which was a two lane street, just like Fillmore was, and uh, not only widened it, but also created what people often call the Geary Moat, which really um, tore the neighborhood apart. It was this giant demarcation line between one part of the Fillmore and the other, and uh, really was the start of um, tearing the neighborhood apart. You can see here uh, on Fillmore Street uh, that the redevelopment agency went through the 20 square blocks of the neighborhood um, and every single building got a number. You can see those at the top there. And the number corresponded to these two page uh, assessments that they did for every building. And they would get demerit points for things like, uh, you know, not peeling paint or if they saw any rats, but also they got demerit points if they had a person of color either owning or living in the building, which tells you everything you need to know about what they were trying to do. This is a photograph from a little later, uh, probably the what, mid, mid 50s, I think. Um, and at first there was sort of wholesale just tearing down of the Victorians. One of the things that can't happen, this kind of redevelopment has been studied in, in urban um, planning uh, departments all over the world, actually. And one of the things that came out of it was the architectural preservation, that the idea that a building, if it's deemed to have, have architectural significance, had to be vetted before it could be torn down. And activists in the neighborhood actually stopped this in its tracks, which is why the neighborhood had um, empty lots and looked like a war zone for many years, because um, they were able to stop some of the destruction and, and actually some of the Victorians were put on the backs of trucks and moved elsewhere as it happened to, to Jimbo's Bob City. Um, but nothing was built in this place, partly because they could not get loans. It sort of stopped the process. So somebody's asking about, um, they just took the properties with zero in comp compensation. So what would happen is that the redevelopment agency, if you owned the building, because there's a difference between owners and renters, of course. So if you own the building, the redevelopment agency would come and knock on your door and said, this is what you're being paid for your property. It was far less than what it would be worth if you could just go and sell it on the open market. Here's the money and you have three months to get out of there. If you were a renter, you got no money at all. You were simply told you had a couple weeks to leave. There was no assistance in helping you move or find a new place to leave. It was simply, we are tearing out this neighborhood. This neighborhood, You need to get out and get out of here. And that was the same for the businesses. If you didn't own your own building, you were told to leave. Sometimes, like in the case of Jacks of Sutter, you were given a new, a new uh, storefront to utilize um, while your old uh, space was being demolished. But then they would often come and tear down that space as well. And so you were simply out of business after that. So Jacks of Sutter was on Jack on Sutter Street. That building was being torn down. So they were moved to the corner of uh, Fillmore and Geary. Fortunately for them, and they are literally one of the few uh, clubs that this happened to, that was one of the few buildings that was actually saved and they were able to remain um, open until the 1980s when it got turned into the boom boom room. Um, and actually Red Powell who had the shoeshine parlor had been displaced a number of times and that's partly why he was so bitter. Yes. Um, so the other thing was interesting is well, um, the building that was like two over from the Fillmore in that shot that David Johnson um, was that the Odd Fellows Hall? I, could, I always get these wrong, but it that was the Scottish Rites Temple, so basically a Masonic lodge. It became a. Uh, it was a church, and actually was taken over. Became People's Temple, which was taken over by Jim Jones. And it was interesting uh, that a lot of the people that joined that church were people who had been displaced. Um, it was interesting. Uh, all, most of the people that were had to move were put on, said put their names on a list. Although it turns out, I think one family actually was able to return. But I think because of the sort of trauma, even for people who had moved, um, people joined People's Temple because they wanted to have a connection to that had been just you know uh, disrupted by this move. 
And um, at one point, Jim Jones was, you know, he was pretty well uh, connected to the pol politics of San Francisco, but um, he got more and more strange and eventually moved to Guyana. And a large percentage of the people that uh, he forced to commit suicide um, were residents or the offspring of residents who had lived in the Fillmore. So this is kind of, one of those things where this tragedy kind of compounded itself and, and has continued um, to the future. So Lou, um, Anise is saying that we're heading towards 1.30 and I think that's our cutoff point. So do you want okay. to take some questions now and uh, yes. in the, net, the last 10 minutes? Okay, let me go through a couple of these really quickly. I, I'll just say this is, um, was the cover of our original edition and this is John Handy on the left, Pointy Point Dexter, a young John Coltrane and Frank Fisher. Um, uh, and John Handy and Frank Fisher played the first time we displayed this work. And this is uh, kind of what the, the middle edition of the book looked like. And here's John Handy uh, on Fillmore Street in front of one of the posters. Here's Frank Fisher who lives in Richmond with me with his flugelhorn in his backyard. He's also been, they both been very supportive of the book. Here he is as an opening at the African American Historical Society in San Francisco. And here are um, many of the, uh, uh, including David Johnson on the lower right and Frank Fisher and John Handy and Elizabeth and I. And I remember this the poster was up on the street at one point and an older gentleman was in front and I asked him, um, so what do you think of this? He says, I come to see this because it reminds me of the best time of my life, that, that at its height, the Fillmore was an amazing place. This is there's a jazz festival that takes place there still every year. Um, we've been able to show the work in the neighborhood and different other places. This is a photograph that's in the latest edition and it was a gathering of all of the musicians um, from that time, um, and it was photographed by, uh, made by Sonny Buxton and a number of, uh, um, somebody else is gonna kill me because I'm not remembering his name. Do you remember who also gave us the photograph? I don't, don't really sorry. So the other thing is, so there's vestiges of the past. Actually, this sign, New Chicago Barbershop, which leans very important in the story, has completely been obliterated. Um, and uh, my friend Mildred did a installation in that overpass, um, and it's been allowed to deteriorate and we're, we're trying to get it either restored or taken away because I think it's really disrespectful to the history. But the, I always say this is an indication of the ghosts of the area. And so uh, somebody, yeah. I just want to answer, answer a quick question. Somebody was asking about the hotels located. Um, yeah. You can see, uh, I actually worked with the redevelopment agency to put in uh, some markers for where clubs and venues used to be. So. If Fortunately, they didn't do a very good job of installation. Um, but if you walk around the neighborhood, you can see these uh, bricks in the building, I mean, in the sidewalk and see where some of the places were located. Um, the Manor Plaza was at 930 to uh, Fillmore Street, so right near the Blue Mirror. And the Booker T. Washington was at uh, 1540, sorry, I have to put on my glasses. Yes, 1540 <laughs> Ellis Street. Um, and the other question here is about Minnie's Can Do Club. Minnie's was really after the time period that we focused on. Um, so, but you, there is stuff in the book about Minnie's Can Do. And probably a kind of, as plays were replaced, where, where, where um, it, it kind of filled a gap for the places that were closed. Although it, it, they overlapped a little bit. This is what the new edition of the book, uh, published by Heyday Book of Berkeley. And we are both thrilled because it's being distributed uh, nationally and we don't have to schlep books to bookstores anymore. And um, as the books have progressed, the graphics and the reproduction has and more detail have continued to be added. So we're really happy about that. And you can purchase our book um, on the uh, MOAD website. Um, and if you are on our Zoom call, they just posted uh, the link um, on the chat area. And Mars Breslow was the photographer yeah, of the City yeah. Hall. Uh, right. That, that picture with the mayor, that, that actually Mayor Willie Brown put together. So both Mayor Willie Brown and Mayor L London Breed are both very strong supporters of the book. London Breed is actually from the neighborhood, so she knows about it. And um, this is her she's taking a look at the new edition. 
And here we are. Uh, this is the website um, if you want more information and access to the oral histories. We'll leave that up for a little while. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Um, someone's asking about the city making proper reparations to the owners and renters. Uh, there has never been any offer of that at all. Um, the redevelopment agency at the time gave these uh, certificates to uh, business owners and residents that they were going to be the first in line to be able to come back into these uh, housing, the modern housing that they were supposedly going to be build, building. But in actuality, literally only one person ever used one of those certificates because it took so long between the time that they tore the buildings down and the time that they were built. And so people, of course, had to move away and, and restart their lives. And so, um, and now because redevelopment agencies throughout California have been dissolved, uh, there's not even an agency any longer um, that could give the compensation. And certainly the city, I don't think, would ever broach that subject. And I think the, well, the, one of the ways I got involved in kind of gathering this information was uh, like subsequent generations of the redevelopment agency at least uh, were attempting to make some reference to this, this history that had really literally been erased by doing things like the, um, uh, the the sort of uh, bricks on the sidewalk and you know there's there are also posters and uh, banners on the street kind of referencing Fillmore's jazz history um, and I think the jazz festival came from that so it did not um, it certainly didn't uh, compensate for what had been destroyed but I think there were some efforts to at least um, make some reference to this thing that had been literally take sort of erased uh, and with, with little trace. Someone just Any put on the chat that uh, there is uh, Assemblywoman um, Shirley Webb Weber is trying to uh, have a reparations bill um, so people can look into that. Um, someone asked about uh, art styles. I've never seen a book that covers any of uh, the art styles that were prevalent in the Fillmore district during the Harlem of the West time period. Um, you get some hint of it if you see the sort of interiors of the clubs, but um, I, uh, you know, that's, I don't think that's what a lot of the photographers were looking for. They were photographing people. They were interested in the kind of both audience and the performers. And we just want to again encourage you, if you have information on anyone in the photographs, if you have photographs yourself of this time period that we're covering, the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, um, please uh, let us know. Um, and we also encourage people to do their own uh, projects of uh, the Fillmore neighborhood. Um, this is certainly not the only story that's that needs to be told. There are many other stories waiting to be told about the Fillmore. And uh, we hope that there's other people out there um, that will do so. Uh, Bayvac recently did a uh, documentary on the neighborhood that brings a story to the present day with many young musicians and artists and, and other young people in the neighborhood that are keeping the uh, artistic aspect of the Harlem of the West going. So if you go to Bayback's website, you can um, watch that documentary and hear about some of the exciting things that are currently being done in the Fillmore neighborhood. And, the, and the, I would say the same thing is probably true for Hunter's Point and the blues situation that was uh, going on, it was prevalent in Oakland. And I think those are stories that really do need to be told. Whether it's Elizabeth and I at this point, I don't know. I, I think <laughs> We're getting old. <laughs> enthusiastic people to do that. But I think that these stories are really important. And I, I think, A, I've seen some footage of like young people, you know, watching um, video of Nina Simone and Billie Holiday who didn't know who they were and how that's influenced them. And you sort of see nothing's happening from the beginning that you can kind of take it in new directions but you can also it's really important you need to know your past before you can move to the future very true um there's people that raise their hand on on 
the Zoom thing. I'm not, I don't really know what that means. Um, if you have a question, if you could type it. Uh, yeah. They're telling us they're here. I think we're about to end, but please, I think the, our emails are listed. We really want to hear from you if you have questions or if you have information for us. Because at the, the last session, we heard from some of the families, um, and unfortunately, the chats uh, didn't su survive the uh, recordings. But you should probably, this, this is being recorded, and please let other people know who you know might be interested to see it. And um, especially if, if our contact information is listed. And you can find us also on this Harlem of the West SF uh, website. We also have a Facebook um, page. So uh, there's lots of ways to sort of access this information and also to get a hold of us. And thank everybody again for, uh, for tuning in. And thank you to the San Francisco Public Library and to MOAD and actually to the African American um, Historical Society and the, uh, art, the African-American art and cultural complex, which have all been really supportive of us um, and uh, hopefully it'll be more in the future. And, and San Francisco History Weekend. Yay, history. Oh, yeah, absolutely, oh, yes. And the, the, the Bayview Opera House actually has an exhibit of um, work from the, the period and the book, which I'm assuming will be accessible once things open up again, because the work is up on the walls already.